what do you believe right now that's making you feel this way? And when you analyse it, you realise how irrational you can be at times. Every single one of our major customers and minor customers all shut their doors overnight. It's not sales per se, but the outcome of it is because people get to know you, they get to see you. Making those efficiencies to maximise service profits as well as just product profits. When you lose the enthusiasm, that's the point to move on. Scaling up a business isn't easy. If it were, we wouldn't have less than 4% of businesses scaling beyond 10 employees or around a million pound turnover level and less than 1% beyond 50 employees. But the contribution that we make as owner managers to our economies is immense and should never be underestimated. Yet it can be a tough gig for all of us at times. And only other business owners truly understand the challenges that we face. And through Scale Up Radio, we aim to help make things a little easier. We interview guests who have been where you are now and may have faced some of the challenges that you are facing. And they offer their thoughts and advice on what has worked for them as well as what didn't. And we've also combined many of the lessons from these interviews and also through working with hundreds of owner managers over the last 10 years or so into a practical scale-up handbook that we've called the Entrepreneurial Scale-Up System, or ESIS. And it's for owner managers like you and me as we navigate our own scale-up journey. And you can order a copy through your favorite online book retailer or by going to all the W's, esisgroup.co.uk www.esusgroup.co.uk In this episode, I'm excited to have Adam Pierce, the director of Minerva Innovation Group, a financial services company that specialise in R&D funding and tax relief. And Adam's expertise and his unique approach have earned both him and his company recognition and success in the industry. Throughout our conversation, we dive deep into the world of R&D tax relief and its positive return on investment. We explore Adam's journey from a professional basketball player to founding Minerva Innovation Group, where he helps businesses with that R&D tax relief. And we uncover some of the valuable lessons that Adam's learned from his sports career and how they apply to business. So whether you're a business owner looking to maximize R&D tax relief or an aspiring entrepreneur seeking inspiration, then we've got the episode for you that's packed with insights and strategies to help you to thrive. And let's join Adam Pierce on Scale Up Radio. Welcome to another episode of Scale Up Radio. Today I'm here with Adam Pierce, who is director of Minerva Innovation Group. So, Adam, welcome to Scale Up Radio. Good afternoon, Kevin. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, it's a pleasure. So. Tell us about Minerva Innovation Group. What do what do, what do you guys do? So MIG, MIG for short, is it? Um, well, um, just in the contracts, because obviously um, the the name appears so many times that it's just sometimes abbreviated to MIG. But I think um, I like to stick to to Minerva Innovation Group, um, just because we spend so long thinking about the name. But yeah, some people refer to it as Minerva. So what do you guys make. what do you guys do then? We're a financial services company. Um, specializing in R&D funding okay. and even within R&D funding, specializing in, in R&D tax relief. Um, so in essence, what we are trying to do, um, the, the most simplistic summary would be we try and get our clients a cash benefit and then we take a percentage of that. So on a sort of no win, no fee basis. Yeah. We work with quite a, a range of, of R&D companies and uh, we, we, we operate in quite niche sectors. And there are two very niche sectors that we predominantly operate in. And one is the, the animal sciences. So veterinary medicine, horse racing, farming, and the other is architecture. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure we'll, we'll go into that in, in, in a lot more detail. I could, I could probably uh, waffle away here for hours yeah, and no, hours, but that is in that's, essence what we do. No, that's, that's good. And um, so is that, are your clients mainly in the in the UK? Yes, so it's um, a source of UK government funding. Yeah. So therefore, um, the one of the qualifying criteria is that yeah. the the R and D costs go through UK accounts because um, the government is is obviously trying to encourage companies to 
to conduct R&D in the UK. They are um, now even more so doubling down on that. In the past, you were allowed to have at least subcontractors who are part of the R&D team that would be abroad, but now even that is being taken into the UK. So it's very, very UK specific. And I and I and I ask because you tell me off air that you're you're based in Vienna in Austria. Well, yes, yeah, so I'm I'm currently in Vienna, so our company is fully remote, and people have the option to to either work from home, or work from the office, or you know do sort of a, a work from home from abroad for a week or two. That's currently what I'm doing. I'm originally from Vienna, so I'm in Vienna for another week before I return to to the UK. And yeah, I'm I'm I'm, st- I'm still working here. So work from home from abroad as as, as odd as it sounds. Excellent. That sounds sounds great. And you were hinting at it a moment ago. There's there's been a lot of changes in the R and D environment in the in the UK, hasn't there? So you know, <laughs> yeah. what 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 has how's that affected you? And also how how are you different from there's other there's other companies, a number of other companies that offer R and D tax claim tax credit services. So what makes you guys different? Yeah. Well. Obviously, so, so there were obviously two two things you mentioned in terms of the the changes to R and D. Um, those have been significant over the last two years. I think it's fair to say that um, for the first you know two decades of of UK R and D tax relief, there were minimal changes. But in the last two years, there, ha- there has been a complete uh, revamp. Uh, I mentioned the the subcontractor element, but there are other changes as well. You know, reductions to the uplift. Um, so basically a reduction to the return on investment. So yeah. basically in addition to you know, the government increasing corporation tax from 19 to 25%, they're also reducing uh, corporation tax relief in the form of R&D. So there are quite a few changes. Um, and it really is a full-time job and a half to try and keep on top of all these changes. But obviously that is what we're here for. <laughs> That's what yeah. we are being paid to do. Uh, in terms of your uh, second question, um, how we are unique, I, I think there are, a number of, of elements, but I think the, the most important thing is that we are um, hybrids. So we are a group of scientists and accountants um, mm-hmm. or have people with sort of a hybrid um, background. Now we, we work with quite a few accountants who are fantastic accountants, but don't have the scientific background to produce an R&D claim. And we also work with scientists who are industry leading in their field, but don't have the accounting background. Yeah. Um, now, an R&D report, it, an R&D report, the R&D reports that we produce, because that's basically the tangible output of our service. It is basically, um, if, if you imagine a set of annual accounting you know, accounts, sorry, and, and you marry those with a scientific paper, that's, that's basically what we do. And, and you really need that that hybrid knowledge. And I think that is one of the, the, the elements where we're unique, where we're just combining sort of the best best of both worlds. Okay. Uh, um, and that applies to each and every one of our uh, members of staff. Uh, myself, I have a, a postgrad in advanced biomedical science, a postgrad in finance, and I'm currently studying for my ATT exams to be a, a qualified tax technician, which... Um, if you would have told me five years ago I'd be studying to be a, a qualified tax technician, I would, I, would, I, would, I would have thought that's the perhaps, perhaps the lamest title ever, but um, I think it'll be quite useful to have those, those letters behind my, my surname as well. All right, brilliant. Well, I might come back to that in, in, in a minute. But the, um, so one, what you're describing there as well is that because you've got that expertise, that specialist expertise, that's linked with your areas of focus the sectors that you really focus on so strategically that enables you to build up a differentiation against certainly against the general r&d tax claim com- companies Is that correct? exactly exactly yes yeah. so while um, other r&d agents also have you know hybrid um staff and you know some scientists some accountants um i, I think personally that um ours is even more specialized so we have, um, you know, medical R&D reports. So whether it's human medicine or veterinary medicine, uh, they are led uh, by a doctor, a qualified doctor. Um, our computing science R&D reports are led by a software developer. Um, the, you know, sports science and animal sports science, so animal sports science being horse racing, that is led by me, um, who, so I've mentioned my postgrad in biomed, but I've also got an undergrad sports science. And I was a 
uh, professional athletes. So it's really, it's really, we try as much as possible to put people in front of clients that, that really have kind of walked the walk as much as possible, so to speak. Yeah, very good. And you've already mentioned the the, the business model as being a, a kind of a percentage of a success fee. So no, no success, no fee sort of, sort of thing by the, by the sounds of it. Yeah. 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 So in the, the success can obviously be defined in, in different ways uh, because it's um, R and D tax, it could be a cash credit or a future tax reduction. Uh, often we find that it's, it's a mix of the two, but generally when we say no win, no fee, that's, that's sort of what's defined as an R and D benefit of, either a tangible or, or intangible nature. So the, the worst that the prospective client or the client could could lose is, you know, generally speaking, a few hours off, off their time. But because we operate on a sort of commission basis, to, to be quite uh, honest, you know, we don't want to waste our own time. Um, so there's, there's no point in putting through a claim that we think yeah. um, isn't successful because then we, we've just wasted their time and our time. All right. Now, the, and the, my understanding is that certainly a little while back, the R&D tax credits was one of the more underused of the um, tax tax uh, credits that, that was that was around. Now we've had a bit of extra confusion thrown in because of the changes. What would you what would you say to business owners that maybe aren't making use of of, of this facility? Yes, I think. Um companies that are not making use of it i think it is um it, it's it's a shame that they really should um it is there for a reason and the government does produce statistics um, on an annual basis with regards to the return on investment and the return on investment generally speaking is positive so even though a company you know the government may give a, com a company say a ten thousand pound cash injection that isn't a ten thousand pound loss to the taxpayer because that company will then hire more staff, invest in R and D, um, you know, sell a patented product, which will then re result in a much greater tax return on investment to the government. So, um, the government is doing that for a reason. You know, they, they are. A lot of prospective clients say it's kind of too good to be true, um, but yeah, the government is doing it for a reason. So I would say uh, really every company should try and capitalize on it. I think the reason why a lot of companies aren't claiming is because of the confusion that comes with it. Uh, the fact that it is so specialized. And we, as I said, we work with a lot of, um, a lot of vets, a lot of architects, and they are some of the busiest people that you'll ever meet. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if they're working nine, 10, 11 hours a day, uh, going through various um, R and D iterations, they simply do not have time to read up on R and D tax relief. So, so my advice would be, if that is the reason why you're not claiming, um, well, <laughs> get in touch with us, yeah, and, yeah. And, and we will we'll do as much of the, the legwork as possible. Because I think, I think the main reason companies aren't claiming is just the confusion behind it and the legwork required. Good stuff. Excellent. And can you give us an idea of? maybe the stage that Minerva is, is at. And I believe, you know, both the company and yourself have been shortlisted and uh, for various awards and things. So do you want to give us a little bit of a flavor for, for where you are as a business? Yeah, well, in terms of where we are as, as, as a business, I think the, the most noteworthy uh, discussion point is that we were voted best boutique research and development funding specialists 2023 by SME News. So it was the SME Business Elite Awards. Now, it's quite quite a long sentence, you know, best boutique R&D funding specialist, but I think uh, to kind of break that down, the, well, you know, best stands for best, but boutique is really the fact that we are an SME working with SMEs. Um, the R&D funding kind of relates to what I said, you know, being sort of that hybrid between um, accountant and, and scientists and the specialists. I think the specialist is a key term in that award. It's really the fact that we operate in such niche areas, as you said, um, as you said correctly, R&D tax was um, underutilized in the early years, and then it was capitalized on a bit more, uh, given that it's been capitalized on. And obviously, intuitively, people will think about, well, obviously, there's R&D in medicine, but not so many people perhaps think, well, perhaps there's R&D in veterinary medicine. So it's all about um, finding a niche sector and the next sort of niche thing. But I, I think that applies to R&D tax relief as it does to all, all areas of finance. Very good. Excellent. So let's look back at your reasons for getting started. You hinted at the fact that you were a professional athlete. So tell us, tell us a bit more about, about that and what, what brought you to Minerva. Yes. So um, from 
you know, the day I started playing basketball, I, all I wanted to do was become a professional basketball player. Um, at university, I, as I said, when I was doing my undergrad in sports science, I was um, lucky enough to sign a professional contract and play in the British Basketball League. I also played for the um, under-20 Austrian national team. Um, so that was sort of uh, where I peaked or where I plateaued, so to speak, at those two teams, which um, I'm happy with. Yeah. I, in essence, you know, in, in my opinion, it was always a case of I would either be good enough to play for 10 years and, and live off that for the next 40 years, or I would treat it as a bucket list item yeah. do it and then pursue a quote-unquote proper career so um, <laughs> keep, your feet, I, keep your feet on the ground yeah <laughs> yeah so I, I played professionally and then at the end of that I had a, a quite, quite a severe ankle injury um, oh, so sorry to hear that yeah it's, it's, it's it happens so I'm, I'm not I'm not able to to exercise without ankle braces anymore right. and even when I'm sort of going for a hike on a on a on a on a, on a hill, I, I still wear my ankle braces. So uh, I'm not really able to train more than once a day. So, so playing professional basketball was an option. Not saying that I, you know, was guaranteed to be the next <laughs> next, next big thing, but uh, it wasn't an option anymore. So it was certainly a bucket list item. So, um, so then, so, oh, sorry. Yeah, before you, yeah, I'd, I'd really like to join that if, you, if, if you're okay sharing, but you know, of course, I, I can only imagine that that must have been a really difficult time for you and you yeah. you know even if you mentally were you kind of convincing yourself that it was a bucket list item and that you you know you didn't but you know you've had something taken away from you not not only are you actually injured and you're hurt but you've had a potential career taken away from you and you've got to re reset and pick yourself up again you know what was you know what was that time like for you tough uh, the one word answer is tough i think if you play basketball on a competitive level and you commit your life to it and you know that doesn't just cover training it covers nutrition it covers sleep it covers yeah. um it's not just what you do but it's what you don't do you know don't drink don't smoke don't go out or if or i guess if you go out don't go out more than once a month it's um if you if you go on a date with your girlfriend make sure to um not go for a walk but maybe go to the movies so you're at least you're seated so you can recover better in between training so it's there are a lot of sacrifices so to go through all of that in order to then get injured, it's it's it, it's tough. Um, as a, especially as a basketball player, you want to jump and run as fast as you can. So if yeah. you go from wanting to run as fast as you can to not being able to run at all for a while, um, yeah. or even walk with pain, that is very 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 tough. Um, I think I try and always see the best um, in situations, and I've I've trained. Well, I started playing basketball when I was what, 13 years old. I signed a pro contract when I was 21. So I trained eight years for a one-year pro season. Mm -hmm. And and to me, you know, to me, that is a blessing. Um, I, I am very grateful for it. Um, I always think about um, Olympians, you know, think about uh, Usain Bolt, who trains four years for a 10-second event, yeah. right? Yeah. So so me training eight years for a one-year event, I'm, I'm very, very grateful. And it is ultimately sad if, 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 if you think too much about it, it's quite sad. But luckily, I had a, a other interests, you know, an interest in science. So I was able to um, shift focus a little bit. OK, so you shifted focus then. Was that so was that when you um, did your um, did, did your doctorate and that and, and, and that is that, was that after then the basketball career? So so I was playing basketball while I was doing my undergrad in uh, sports science. Yeah. Then I pursued a master's in advanced biomedical science. Yeah. Now the idea, so it was IBMS accredited. So basically the idea was to be a, a biomedical scientist for the NHS, okay. or at least have that background. Because I thought to myself, well, if I pursue an, uh, basically an NHS accredited biomed degree, I could be working for the NHS, which obviously has a great job security, or I could go into the private sector. So I thought, you know, I've sort of got, got sort of both roads covered, so to speak. Um, I, I pursued the master's in, in biomed, and then I was still not sure what to do. I just knew I was quite fond of science. I um, went on a number of um, unpaid internships that I created myself. So I did, Two things mainly so um, it resulted in two successful internships so i reached out to a number of local labs 
um, and just offered my services saying, look, I'm pursuing a, an MSc in, in biomed. I'd love to just shadow or assist you in, in, in whatever way possible. Um, obviously, labs are, are struggling for, for cash and for staff. So I, get, I got a, a surprising amount of sort of positive responses and I was uh, volunteering in the lab just to see if that is what I ultimately want to do. I then reached out to, um, <laughs> to Scottish Parliament uh, <laughs> to just say, well, may I, you know, create an internship, an unpaid one uh, for you guys in the sort of health policy sector to, at the time, I ultimately reviewed uh, methadone uh, consumption in, in Scotland and what the, 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 the actual uh, result of that was. Um, so I, I secured an internship through that as well. Um, and that, that, was, that was it, to really give me an idea of whether I want to be in the lab or more in the field and sort of, you know, yeah. politics and, and finance. And yeah, ultimately, I, I, I realized that being in a lab is, is, is interesting, but I want to be more in the field of sort of, you know, finance and politics. And obviously, you know, um, anything that relates to accounting and, and, and tax it, it is quite, quite political because you have to stay up to date with, you know, what's happening in the world. And yeah, I mean, I could go on and on, but um, I was called by, uh, I, I received a call from a recruiter who invited me to an interview for a, a um, graduate telesales position, which I had no interest really in um, pursuing that career. But I attended the interview because I thought I could just work on my skills. Attended the interview and they then said to me, well, we have no interest in considering you as a, as a telesales executive, but we'd like to um, hire you as a, as, a, as a more senior consultant. So that was, that was an R&D tax. And that was an opportunity okay. that was kind of too good to um, reject so that's how I landed in R&D tax it's a it's a very random journey from basketball to R&D tax but but yeah uh, long story short that's how I how I got into the industry all right great and and then and then um, and then you moved across to to, to Minerva as as the one of the directors at, at Minerva well um obviously I'm I'm the the company director and and founder of yep. uh, Minerva Innovation Group so the I did the MSc in biomed, then two years as an employee in R&D tax as a consultant, then pursued a postgrad in, you know, an MSc in finance, and then uh, built uh, Minerva Innovation Group as, you know, the um, yeah. company director and founder um, or, or, or co-founder. Great. And, and I think you've had um, not just business success, but also recognition for yourself, as a, as um, in in terms of the startup uh, startup and young entrepreneur sort of type type awards, is that correct? Yes. So um, the Great British Entrepreneur Awards. So uh, Stephen Bartlett referred to them as the the Grammys of entrepreneurship. Um, I was a start I was a startup entrepreneur of the year finalist last year, and I was nominated for Services Industries Entrepreneur of the Year. Um, for this year, which will be in November, which um, it's it's obviously lovely to uh, receive these nominations and these awards, you know, individually. But uh, to me, the the most important thing is always the the, the company awards. Um, yeah. Undoubtedly, it's the, it's it's the company awards, and and it's really the less formal recognition. You know, the having clients, you know, thank us for for what we do and, and how we help fund their research. You know, one of our first clients uh, was an oncologist and, you know, as part of the sort of debrief, they told us that the, the funding that we, the cash injection that we've helped them generate um, has resulted in, in an additional number of uh, patients being trialed for a new cancer drug. And I think that is, that is a million times uh, more special to me um, than than these awards even the awards are pretty cool but you know yeah. helping the field of r d helping small businesses not just thrive but often just survive you know during covid and the cost of living crisis you know that is very very special excellent so how do you think your experience as a professional basketball player as a professional athlete has um helped you in, in in business you know what 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 do you think that you've been able to bring across from all of all of that eight years of really yeah. focused almost i imagine almost obsessive nature of, uh, of getting yourself to a pinnacle of, uh, of a sporting career so i think the 
key transferable skill is just uh, the knowledge of you know knowing that you have to go the extra mile um, in basketball if or in sports in general you know if there's a if you if team training is two hours a day and you attend those two hours a day uh, the, the chances of you starting you know being being the starting lineup or even in the roster at all are are slim so i knew i would have to uh, arrive an hour early stay an hour late or you know do an extra two hours in the morning and i knew that was that was that really was drilled into me that was that was the baseline so i think that is the most important thing because when we you know when when, when i built minerva innovation group in the in the in the early years i was working seven to five was the were the most common hours plus overtime were were needed if there was an upcoming deadline so you know 10 to 11 10 to 12 hours a day so i think that the, the most transferable thing was was just hard work i think there's a bit of an idea that um you know if if, if you do your nine to five hours as long as you have been with a company long enough then you'll get an automatic promotion but it's it's just not how sports works yeah. um you, you could be with a team for three years five million years um, it doesn't mean at all that you'll be in the starting lineup or in the lineup at all and it doesn't mean that you'll be that you know coach will run plays for you so that is the number one thing i've kind of learned and transferred yeah yeah so it's you know very much a, a meritocracy you you really have to have to perform it's not just a case of turning up and, uh, and going through the motions you know and, yeah. and you're applying that to the business side as as well then from what you're saying yeah yes yes very good very good so what surprised you what lessons have you learned then from branching out on your on your own you know what sort of things what are some of the key inflection points and lessons that you that you've learned along the way well the the first thing that was very surprising was how open companies were to boutique R and D um, tax agents. Okay. So a team of R and D tax agents, generally speaking, will consist of about two to four people. So you have, you know, sort of one lead on the tech side, a lead on the finance side, a lead on the sort of admin to to make sure everything goes smoothly. And then perhaps a sort of one account manager that, that manages the other three. Sort of two, two to four, generally speaking. Now, because of that, it doesn't matter. It turns out it doesn't matter too much to clients whether they work with a multi-million pound international company or with a boutique UK SME. So that was the, the first thing that I've observed very, very quickly. Okay. And I, I, I remember... Um, there was one client that joined us and during the debrief, they said, well, you know, we've, we, we, we thought the service was fantastic. Uh, we've claimed before, but you have significantly increased the claim benefit that we've received. Um, would you like us to write a, a, a testimonial <laughs> for, uh, you know, for your boss, um, so you can perhaps get a promotion or something, you know, something along those lines. And and that's when I when I kind of um, you know outlined that. Well, actually, I'm, I'm I'm the company director. So that was the number one thing I've noticed, and I think that was really um, that that was the kind of proof and the confirmation that that I needed, that we needed, that you know there is a lot of business to be made for for boutique companies. You know, you don't have to be a multi-million pound company. And the sort of analogy that I sometimes use is, is you know, is, is if you go to a dentist or a hairdresser, it does not matter whether they're part of a multi-million pound international company, because ultimately, as I said, similar to Arnie Tax, it's only two or four people that actually work hands-on on, well, the claim or a tooth or, or a haircut. Yes, that, that's true. Although the flip side of that 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 you'll we'll, we'll sometimes face is that um, is establishing that credibility of where yeah when you can can be tricky. No, um, I, I fully agree with that, and that is, I think the credibility of the company usually equals the credibility of the individuals. And, and I mentioned that, you know, I've, I've got a postgrad in biomed and a postgrad in finance, but on top of that, right now, I'm still studying for my ATT exams to be 
um, a qualified tax technician. So that would make me um, Adam Pierce, MSC, MSC, ATT. Yeah. And that I, th I think personally, the, the credibility really um, comes from the individual credibility rather than the, the company credibility, because um, it is still ultimately me producing, for example, the R&D claim, whether it's on behalf of Minerva or on behalf of, you know, where, you know, where I was an employee. And I think that was, you know, that was the, the, the kind of biggest surprise um, when, when, when building the company. Yeah. And, and also you've got your, your specialist involved, as you say, you, with the, with the, with the specialist areas that you're yep. focusing on that enables you to build up that credibility within those areas as opposed to trying to be too much of a jack of all trades i fully agree um if we have a developer speak to another developer they, they will be able to with it within a minute or two yeah establish that they you know yeah. they will speak the same language and it, it it really as i said doesn't matter what company they represent um, it will be a person-to-person -person engagement, and you know if if you're discussing biomedical science, software development, um, engineering, you know if you have that person-to-person -person conversation, they'll know exactly whether or not that person knows what they're talking about. You know. Good. So, what are some of the things that, looking back, you might do might do differently um, if you were to start up again? I think in terms of our client portfolio expansion strategy mm -hmm. um we're our, we currently operate um so our business expansion is based purely on word of mouth so we have obviously consultants that and we, and we try and deliver a fantastic service that clients are happy to vouch for um, at the start i pursued the sort of tr more traditional sales approach um so you know, once we started hiring, the, the first hire was a salesperson, a sort of traditional salesperson of um, basically, you know, cold calling, trying to book meetings that the consultant would then attend. But it was, and, 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 and I guess it's worth saying that this is the industry standard for R&D tax, generally speaking. Mm -hmm. um, you have a sales team and a team of consultants. But we, we found that, um, well, we, we thought that we could, could be different we were quite naive we thought that well there's always this disconnect between sales and consulting because yeah. sales are tasked with signing contracts and then perhaps sometimes over promise and kind of promising things that are almost impossible to deliver on uh, but we, we kind of thought to ourselves well we, we'll be different we will yeah. train the sales staff as much as possible and they will not over promise and they will we'll teach them all the scientific terminologies so people will know that they have a you know a scientific expertise to, to, to some degree but it, it just didn't work out and it, yeah there was a lot of sort of you know not over promising but sort of miss pitching the yeah. the the, the r d scheme um not quite being able to use that um, science lingo and um it uh that that was um yeah that was a loss making variable um that that um, sales department uh, within the business uh, for the time, but now that we operate on a purely, um, you know, purely based on on word of mouth, um, it, it's a very successful strategy, um, and through that we're able to, yeah, um, as I said, expand with with minimal with virtually no sales resources. So that is the one thing I would change. Um, if, if, if it's one thing I could change, but generally yeah. speaking, I, I uh, don't like to think that way. You know, I, I, I like to um, not live in regret. So, so uh, you know, it is what it, what it is. And it, it's it an kind of shaped us. Uh, it's an interesting, it's an interesting lesson to learn, isn't it? Because in some sectors, you definitely need to have that separate sales sales team. And in a way, it's sometimes it's advantageous to have them separate, very separate from the delivery team, but in other sectors and, you know, typically, high professional services really high in-depth understanding of what's what's going on then there can be that disconnect it can be very hard to get somebody to do that and I, I know in you know in certain even in you know take the take the pharmaceutical industry you often have to have somebody in between say the marketing aspects of the business and the r d side of the, of the business there somebody that kind of speaks both marketing and R and D language to, to to make to transition that gap. Yeah, 
No, no, I fully agree that, you know, some industries and some companies, they will need to have a sales team. And I think with the bigger hardly tax agents, I think that, you know, there's no way that a, you know, multi-million pound company, you know, international company will re re rely just on referrals. It's, yeah. it's, it's too risky. So I think they're very much playing a numbers game. And, uh, you know, if you have a team of a hundred telesales executives or commercial associates, as I refer to, um, and they're making 70 calls a day, you know, just based on these numbers, um, it's, it's almost impossible to not secure a contract through that. So they're, they're, they're going, you know, they're, they're relying on, on that volume um, which we don't have to rely on because we're more boutique. And that's why we can have that smooth um, transition from sort of quote unquote sales to consulting without that disconnect. And it really maximizes the client experience. Brilliant. So tell me, turn to the cash side of the business a little bit, because it strikes me that it's probably quite a lumpy cash flow in that you're working with a client over a period of time doing their claim and then depending on whether there's, you know, how successful they are, you've got a percentage of, of, of that coming in. So how does that impact the business, the cash flow side of things? Oh, well, in terms of um, cash flow, you know, without um, oversharing too much, we, we obviously basically provide our services free of charge until the very end. Yeah. So um, I always say during the consultations, there's no such thing as a, as a silly question. So we'll go through a phase of, of being asked everything about you know what is R&D tax? What do you do? What are you, what, is, what is your background? So we do obviously all of that free of charge. We then um, produce the financial calculations. Uh, we then produce the technical report. We then do all the account management to ensure the submission is done successful. Um, then the claim is processed by HMRC, which takes um, the the figures differ, but generally speaking, it's ninety in ninety five percent of cases, um, claims are being processed and paid out within twenty eight days. Um, so, so, so we spend, you know, say a month of, of starting the engagement, a month of producing the claim, just yeah. to give you an example, then a month of the client uh, waiting for their benefit, and then they would pay us within, um, you know, a, a number of days. Yeah, so you've got, a, you've got five months potentially from <laughs> yeah. start to when so, you actually get the money, and you're working, it, you're spending time, and therefore money really in, in in working on those, those projects over that time before you get the money yeah so um yeah again without sort of um oversharing too much it's it, to be fair that is how it works obviously with most uh, most r d tax agents so that's just kind of part of um the the, the cash flow cycle in that industry um we um obviously we started off and then expand it as opposed to, you know, um, starting off with, with, with a massive team. We started off with a smaller team and then expanded that. Um, and that's expansion correlated to the expansion of our client portfolio. So that's yeah. basically how we did it um, to ensure that, uh, you know, we have no cash flow issues basically. Yeah, no, fair, fair enough. Yeah, I imagine it's, you know, once you get up to a certain, certain volume, you've got, you've got the lumpy cash flow, but it's coming in frequently enough because you've got enough of it that it actually smooth, starts, to, starts to smooth it out. But it must have been difficult at the beginning, I, I, I would imagine. Yeah, at, at, at the beginning, you know, it was all, um, we really just focused on the consulting uh, basically nothing else we just focus on the consulting and providing a good service you know once we now that we have a, a lot of clients um that's when as you said you know uh, things trickle in and it's all phase and it comes in waves so 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 so, so now things are, are are good um we have obviously uh, pursued a few sort of uh business partnership campaigns uh, we we're official sponsors of a basketball team the leicester riders Very they're good. one of the best uh, pro basketball teams in the uk we are um, supporters of Heroes uh, because we work. So they're a charity that uh, retrains and rehomes um, ex racehorses, yeah. and they're also used to um, educate special needs children. So we're we're sort of we're supporters of them, and we're also um, part of an energy association where we've worked with a few. Um, um, SME energy companies in a sort of renewable energy sector. So, so yeah, so now that obviously the business, the client portfolio expands and the yeah. sort of invoices come in after those months, as you say, um, yeah. we were kind of pursuing those partnerships more and more. Super. And is it the case that once you've done an R&D tax claim for a company, it's all gone well, they're likely to come back in subsequent years to, to, to do it each year? Yes. So yeah. um, we 
I kind of told myself I won't give uh, away too many figures, but that's the one figure I'll give you. Um, we <laughs> are currently, um, quote unquote, losing 0. 0.3 clients a month, which is virtually nothing. So one client every three months. Everything else, every every other client comes back, which is an incredible statistic um, because 0. 0.3, and, and that mainly relates to companies that simply, t you know, t that stop doing R&D due to COVID or due to cost of living crisis, they've stopped investing in R&D or that uh, simply didn't survive uh, COVID and the cost of living crisis. So it's not the person, but the, the business. Yeah. Um, so so 0.3 a month, so one one every three months is incredible. So everything except for that one every three months, you know, every every, every other client except for that um, does return, which is, an, there is no um, official statistic on that, but if there were, I would be quite confident in saying that this is industry leading. Um, so yeah. by having that consultant led approach, we, we have very good reoccurring business. Yeah, so it gives you a very high, high retention rate. Great, so what, what do you, you, know, you clearly love what you're doing. What, what is it that you, that, that, that you love most about what you do with Minerva? Um, as I said, you know, that example of the, the oncologist kind of saying, yeah, you know, thanks, yeah. thanks, thanks, guys. We, we, we've been able to mm. uh, provide this drug to an extra, you know, say, say 10, 15, whatever, many patients. I think that is what I enjoy the most. That is the most special because there's the R&D element to it. Uh, because I, I wasn't quite interested enough to be in the lab actually doing the cancer research. Right. But being behind the scenes kind of helping fund it, I think that kind of that excites me a lot more. I don't know why, but it excites me a lot more than actually doing the, the lab work. So that's what I really enjoy. But it's not just the R&D side of it. It's it's um, as part of, you know, these 10, 15 extra patients uh, receiving that medication that requires extra staff. So they're hiring more people. So um, there's a financial side of it. There's actually, you know, there is one client who, 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 um, outlined that well, a few clients have sp quite specifically said to me, <laughs> it is a lot of pressure, but it's, it, it's all good fun. But they said, look, this R&D claim will depend, will determine how many staff we hire next year. And another client said, this R&D claim will determine what the annual bonuses will be for our staff. So right. um, it's quite, it's quite yeah. interesting knowing that um, what we do, the calculations that we run on our spreadsheet, the work that we do on our, you know, Word and PDF files, you know, all what we're doing on our, you know, three, four screens, however many screens we have, that results in a tangible, you know, tangible employment or annual bonus for staff. And they don't even know that. I think that is quite enjoyable yeah. to know. That's quite exciting. Excellent. Good. And what, you know, what frustrates you the most? What would you, you know, if you could wave a magic wand, what would, um, what would you change or get rid of? I want to get more hours out of every day. There's only, <laughs> yeah. there are only 24 hours, but, yeah. you know, as I said, during the initial, in the first two years of the business, you know, especially during COVID, because you weren't basically legally allowed to do anything, because you weren't allowed to have fun anyway. So I figured I'll just yeah. put my head down and I'll just yeah. work, work, work. So, so I, I worked a lot and I, I did not sleep a lot. So, so my strategy was, you know, only sleeping, you know, five, six hours a day um, and just doing a lot of work. I would love to, well, now that I am a father since last year, oh, um, I, thank you very much. I want to have a better work-life balance. So being able to somehow get more hours out of a day or more productivity out of a day. So there's obviously the, the, the element of delegating work. There's the element of automating things. There's the element of trying to um, eliminate certain, you know, administrative non-essential workloads. So if I had a magic wand, that's what I would like to um, sort of maximize and, and um, perfect because I, I was not in a very good place um, with w w when I did those, you know, 10, 12 hour work days at only sort of five, yeah. six hours of sleep. I um, did a, a caffeine detox uh, during Lent. I've never done Lent before, but I thought to myself, well, why not just try it out? So mm. one, one of the things I did was no caffeine just uh, from, from 100 to zero. Oh, and I, I remember on the weekends, I would, on a weekend, I would sleep in for 12 hours and I would wake up and I felt like I was hit by a truck. I was, in a, I was uh, my, my caffeine tolerance was at a sort of unhealthy state. So mm. being able to get a lot of productivity out of a day without only sleeping limited amounts, that would be the, the, the magic wish, uh, right. so to speak. And that is often, you know, I think I've heard that before with professional athletes, because you're so driven and you've got that real hard work mentality. And it's essentially, even if you might be in a team, 
you've got to look after yourself and do all do you know do all of that yourself sometimes in business that's great to get the business off the ground and and up and running but it then can be hard to make that transition to where actually you're not trying to do everything yourself and you're trying to get other people to um to hand over to a little bit yeah i think i think you're correct i think there's the team element to it but also there's a physiological feedback when you exercise um, right. you can train until you cramp up and that's yeah. when you know okay well i'm cramping now i can't walk i'll it's time to go to bed and yeah. i'll start again tomorrow morning but with well any office work you know you can just keep working and working and working and it's it's more of a marathon rather than a sprint so you it it, it kind of just slowly compounds and then you know half a year goes by and you realize you're just um basically addicted to caffeine and you're just just not in a good place yeah. anymore so um yeah but yeah, I agree what you say. Um, all right, good. So what's the what's the legacy you want to, want to leave? What's it all for? I think in terms of legacy, I think, um, as I said, you know, we, we have these company awards. I have a few individual awards and, and nominations, but that compared to good client feedback, that means, uh, you know, compared to that client feedback, it means nothing to me. I think the legacy, I just, you know, want clients and employees to just be able to kind of say you know you've you've done things the right way i think it's very you know we're not the traditional financial services company that has you know strict kpis and figures we're very much uh driven on you know value and consulting and doing things the right way so the legacy would just be to do it the right way and if in the process we could uh cure a rare disease or um that, that would be fantastic as well for yeah, the field yeah. of animal sciences or in the field of architecture you know come up with the next novel material um that it achieves you know the most stringent fire engineering standards to ensure grenfell will never ever ever happen again that would that that would be pretty cool too brilliant no i love that i love it super are you um you up for a couple of quick fire questions I've, it's, it's been fascinating so far are you up for a couple of quick fire <laughs> yes of course of course great stuff so if you could go back to your younger self what uh, what advice would would that be? You can pick you know, pick whether that's pre basketball, post basketball, or whatever whatever you do. But if you go back to your younger self, what what advice would you give to yourself? Well, um, I have one specific advice and one general advice. Well, the specific specific advice was when I there was obviously a specific game where I suffered the that 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 final ankle injury. So yeah. perhaps something along the lines of. Um, miss that game or you know, don't <laughs> stay home that day uh, but yeah. to, to be honest it that injury facilitated you know where i am today so there's a part of me that kind of wouldn't want to have it any other way because i'm, I'm very very happy with where i'm right now in life so yeah i would have to think about that but that may be one of these specific bits of advice i would say generally speaking advice to my younger self is just to um, stay focused okay because whether it's sports or university or work, you know, business, there are so many moments where you think to yourself, well, is all of this worth it? Yeah. And you yeah. simply do not have a, an answer until you're at the finish line. You just don't have an answer. So it's just yeah. to stay focused, um, like whether it's sports or, or, or business, because if there's always struggle in, in sports, at university and work, there's always, always, always struggle. But if you, quit obviously that struggle is is permanent yeah. Yeah. but if you keep going that that struggle can convert into into success brilliant good are there any what books or podcasts uh, made a difference to you that you recommend to others well obviously scale up radio uh, <laughs> first and foremost uh, but Stephen Bartlett is obviously fascinating to listen to him Joe yeah. Rogan as well um, they obviously interview some of the the biggest players in in whether it's sports or medicine or or business or finance um steven barlett joe rogan um jordan peterson just for sort of uh, life and philosophy in general um books uh i read well, the most recent book i read was shoe dog by phil knight yeah very interesting uh, yes. reading about him almost um you know nike almost collapsing mm -hmm. a million times um, and he just about saves the business. And then in the final hurdle where he isn't able to, 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 to save the business, 
he's kind of quote unquote forced to go public and then goes from, okay, I can't keep this alive anymore, this business to, okay, I'm now a multi multimillionaire um, because he went public. So that, that's an interesting journey. Um, there's a few more sort of business books I would like to read. The Art of the Deal is, is one of them. Um, but yeah, that's, so, I don't have the sort of one go to. Yeah, no, that's, book that's, or podcast. That, that's great. Absolutely. What, what apps or maybe bits of software have you found particularly useful and make a difference? I think, um, so I have a, I have a work phone and a personal phone and both are, so my, my wife said they're sort of uh, laid out as if I have dementia. Um, <laughs> the, the, the widget for the, for calendar, for Google calendar is the ver is on the very front page and it, or front screen and it covers the entire screen and it in both my professional life and personal life, I have, you know, what my wife considers a few ridiculous sort of blockers, um, almost almost timing breakfast to make sure I don't, you know, hang around too long. Right. Uh, so 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 any 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 sort of calendar, my calendar app would be the, the main app. Uh, I would not know what I would do without it. My to do list is my calendar, and my my inbox. So you're quite obsessed in how you organise your days, then, are you? By the sounds of it, your time. Yes, I remember. Um, I've, I've I've changed my sort of uh, morning routines around. Uh, quite a bit especially now that I've had a, a baby daughter but but mm. during COVID I would have you know get up at six um ice bath until 6 20 uh brush my teeth and be be dressed by 6 30 and be it, it was it, it was I didn't realize how ridiculous it was until my 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 wife kind of uh trolled me for it and then I had to kind of stop it and be more be more more even more you know, more flexible but <laughs> my kind of my body clock interestingly gets used to to sort of morning routines and routines in general so at some point i don't even need the calendar anymore and i just do things for an exact amount of time even without it being in my calendar um which is kind of interesting interesting and, do you th and that sounds like that's come from your sporting sporting background as well with that discipline Mo most likely obviously as you know as an athlete, you, yeah yeah um they're they're fantastic um they're after a, a few minutes um but yeah, I think I think it comes from the sporting background because when you you know I would back in the days uh, I would have to just ensure to sleep um, as, as much as possible and there's quite a strict sleep schedule, so it was something you know, like you know ten minutes before and it was ten minutes before nine or ten minutes before ten um, I would have a um, an alarm um, just to, to to go to bed and then obviously two hours before that don't use. Um, your phone, don't watch TV, um, you know, dim all the lights. So I had a sort of uh, quite um, an, an anal routine and I, I just kind of transferred that, not not really knowing, not knowing that that wasn't a normal thing to do in, yeah, in, in yeah, business. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. No, really, really interesting. Okay. And who's had the, who's had the most influence on you? Would you say, um, who do you look up to maybe in business? <sighs> Well, um, as a leader at least. The, well, most, most, I guess there's just two, two sort of answers there. The most, most impact has to be my family, my wife and daughter. Um, there's yeah. nothing more important, you know. If, if, if I wake up at six a.m. and perhaps I'm tired, or think to myself, you know, how can I, how can I sleep in and just, you know, not work hard um, for for those two? Um, that is the biggest inspiration, and it's, it's. Um, especially since I had a daughter, it's way more powerful than the strongest caffeine shot or the strongest double espresso. It's, it really is the biggest motivator. Um, in terms of business, um, I just, it, I don't have a specific, you know, one specific person, but I just admire hard workers and, you know, and what you hear about um, Elon Musk, I know he's sort of semi-controversial for this here and there for the silly things he says and mm. tweets, but the, the hard work that he's put in, you know, sleeping in his office for the first few years and then, um, I mean, he takes it to the extreme because, you know, a, yeah. a number of marriages have failed because he's worked so hard, but it's still the hard work he puts in, um, even though he is already filthy rich, he does not need to work anymore, but he still works hard. I think that is an inspiration, that, that hard work. And then obviously athletes, you have the likes of Kobe Bryant, who um, you hear stories that they sleep in gyms as well, um, just so they're, they can start workouts earlier. So, so just the hard workers, I think they are, they're my inspiration. Brilliant. Really good. And I know you said before that referrals now are your really key, your key source of how you, how you grow, the, grow the business. Yep. How, how do you encourage those referrals? What, what do you do to make those happen? So 
Yeah, we spend a lot of time thinking about how we can streamline that process. You know, what's the best way of doing that? Um, and that, that there are a few sort of projects. Um, but what we have found, and that again was a sort of interesting surprise, is turns out if when companies receive a sort of five or maybe even six figure R&D benefit, you know, we most likely is a cash injection, they tend to bring it up, bring it up to their best friends. Um, um, I mean, I hope they're GDPR compliant as much as possible, but they tend to, re, you know, it, it tends to kind of spread. So mm. the referrals kind of find us more than right. us chasing those referrals, which is, which is quite interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I could go on and on. on no, that's, that, that's, but, that's perfect. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. No, good. All right. No, it's been it, it it's been great talking to you, Adam. Fasc fascinating, and I, and I love some of the some of the links between the professional athlete side of things and the and, and the business and some of the the crossover things, which no doubt have really contributed to help make you as successful as you as, as you are. So, really good. If people would like to find out more about Minerva or, or uh, contact you, perhaps, or find out more about you, what's the best way for them to do that, Adam? Yeah, the best way would just be via email, adam at minervanovation.co.uk. Uh, we have quite a few clients from sectors that um, aren't so fond of emails. They rather just pick up the phone. That's absolutely fine as well. Um, our, both our email addresses and our, our phone numbers are on our website, which, yeah. which is minervanovation.co.uk. But adam at minervanovation.co.uk would be the, the best um, way to go about it. And then just, just a simple one-liner. Um, in terms of what it is that you would like more information on, whether it's the accounting side of things or the science side of things. Um, I always say, and I've mentioned this before, you know, the philosophy is very much there's no such thing as a silly question. We have a few, a, a few clients that are sort of afraid to ask you know, their lawyers a question, a silly question, because they know they'll be charged and it's something like in mm. six minute blocks. But for us, you know, we will not charge you for that. There's no such thing as a silly question. So um, just ping me a quick email with whatever query you have and we'll take it from there. Brilliant. And I, uh, I imagine you're open to connections on LinkedIn as, as yes, well. Yes, I'm, I'm on LinkedIn as well. So LinkedIn, Adam Pierce. Super. Adam, thank you very much indeed for being my guest on Skelet Radio today. Lovely. Kevin, thank you so much. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed that discussion. And if you're building and scaling your own business, you might well be interested in our book, The Entrepreneurial Scale-Up System. And it's exactly what it says on the tin. It's a practical handbook around scaling a business in a structured way. And you can order a copy on all your favorite online retailers, including an audio version, or you can find it and other supporting resources on our website, www.esusgroup.co.uk. That's esusgroup.co.uk, which is E-S-U-S-G-R-O-U-P.co.uk. This has been a Monkey Pants Productions podcast.